themselves. And I know certain people who have, who have met before, that's been a big challenge. Or how do I market myself? How do I let people know the USB? How can I do stuff that will actually make people recognize me in the midst of loads of other options and choices? So Natasha's um, session is going to cover all that. Okay. So if you enjoy, share the mic. Hi, um, I'm Tasha. I have worked in music for about, we we'll are just saying like 14, 15 years, which is a bit mad. Um, I have worked all over the shop. I've done kind of journalism route, I've done a record label route, I've done a bit of management route, and now I run my own marketing agency along with one other girl called Whitney. Um, we're 22 agency, so we do a lot of marketing and creative for artists, whether you're major label signed or independent, kind of everything in between. Um, I've worked with a whole range of artists over the years, whether it's like super, super early developing artists, all the way up to kind of big US stars. Um, Travis Scott, Future, H, Steph London, we're working Usher at the moment, Zara Larson, we're working a couple of like new developing artists, NSG. Um, so genre-wise, it's kind of all across the board, like level-wise, all across the board, budget-wise, it's all across the board. But I feel like the, the one consistent is a marketing strategy. You always have to stay the same. You kind of follow the same principles. Um, Can I just get a show of hands? Just so I know who I'm talking to. In here, who's like artist? Is it any artist in here? Artist, artist, artist. You're all artists. Okay. And do you do all your own marketing or do you have teams? Who do you own? Do you own? All right, lovely. Um, feel free to jump in and ask questions. I have got a Q&A bit at the end. Um, but I tend to talk a lot, so I'm going to try and kind of make it as interesting as possible. Um, so what is music marketing? That sounds like a really basic question, but my mum still today asks me what my job even is, because nobody even understands what it is. Um, most people think music marketing is music PR, and they're completely separate, which you'll find out in the next session as well. Um, music marketing encompasses everything to do with the brand of our, own, of our artist image. Um, the easiest way I like to say is that you're an artist, you look after your own music, your a looks after your music, and then everything else falls onto the marketing team. The marketing person is always like the center point which communicates with all the external teams and tries to piece the whole project together. Um, so we handle everything from the campaign management, um, from the very, very, very start to the very end of the release. Um, we bring it to life through the strategy, creative, digital, and advertising. Um, and the reason I fell in love with marketing is because it's kind of 50-50. It's half super creative, and it's half a little bit nerdy with like the analytics and reporting, because I, I love numbers, but then I'm also quite creative as well. Um, these are the um, components of an effective marketing campaign. I have got a marketing campaign later on in the presentation to kind of show you a little bit more of a breakdown, but I'm just gonna skim over the headlines at the moment. So when you start a project, when I start a project, I always start with a blank document on Google Drive and just marketing plan for X projects, for X artists the first thing you need to figure out is your artist proposition. Um, although you think it is really easy, I find that this is actually one of the hardest questions to do, to actually describe yourself in like three sentences, who you are, and basically if, if nobody knew anything about you, how would you describe yourself? Whether it's your sound, your look, what vibe you want to give, what message you're giving to the world, try and put that down into three sentences, because if you can't articulate that yourself, it's going to be really, really hard to get that message across to people. Um, and next, go on to writing your key highlights to date. So if you're super, super early, then it might be a little bit trickier, but there's always things to highlight, whether it's your first 100 followers, your first 100 streams, your first playlist ad, your, your first radio play, your first show, whatever it is, highlight everything you've done so far. Just again, so you've got a little bit of a track record. Things move really, really fast nowadays, and you always forget stuff that you've done, so it's nice to just see that. And then over time, you can look back at old marketing campaigns and kind of see where you are from there until now. Digital health check is something really important, which again, I'll go into more detail later on, but I start off every campaign by looking across all of my clients' social media pages. So every single account you have online, whether it's your YouTube, your Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and I look through every single element of it from your the images you have, the profile pictures, from the biographies, from your links that you have in your profiles, images that you're using, captions you're writing, uh, interaction with fans, comments, likes, 
just general structure and I like to then just write bullet points of how to improve it. So are all your pictures the same across the board? Are all of your links updated? Do, does one link on your Facebook, because you barely use it, post, like point to your post from six months ago? Or does it actually have your same smart URL that should be across all of your pages? Um, do all of your URLs, do they all match? Are you like called one thing on one page, on one social media platform? And have you got another name on another, on another one? Things like that can be really confusing for fans to find you, so you want to make it as easy as possible. Again, we've got a list of this to show you later on. Um, social growth tracker and KPIs is really important. Again, we start every campaign with just a simple table with a list of all your platforms that you're on on the left-hand side, and then at the top, we've got a week-by-week -week tracker um, with the dates, and then either every Friday morning or every Monday morning, it takes five minutes, go through your platforms and write down how many followers you got. I find this really good to keep an eye on because again, you forget how much things grow over time. Um, especially when you're working on your own or with your own budget, you want to figure out what works. So if you've been working, running advertising, has it worked? If you've been releasing new, mu like new music, has it worked? If you've had a live show, has it worked? So again, over time, you can then track the numbers and see, do you know what, actually week six, my TikTok doubled. What did I post week six? And then you can go back and then replicate the same kind of content. Same thing on, on your YouTube channel. Why did your subscribers jump in week four? Again, you can go back and see the kind of content and activity you were doing around then, and then try and replicate that moving forward. Um, sounds like a bit of a boring job, but literally takes five minutes. And again, it kind of gives yourself a purpose. So if you then notice that your pages are quite stagnant and you've got no, um, oh, my mum's calling me, um, and you've got no growth across your platforms, then you've got to then sit back again and say, okay, why is it not growing? Is your content not working? Um, have you not been releasing as often as you need to be releasing? And then you can kind of take a step back and then kind of re-strategize. Um, figure out what your campaign objectives and your target headlines are. Again, each and every release should give you different targets. Every single one of you in this room should have different targets and objectives for your campaigns because you're all trying to go on a different journey, right? So is it your first radio play you're trying to get? Are you just trying to pay your phone bill? Are you just trying to perform? Like, what is it? How far do you want to get? and then break that down. So, okay, EP1, we're gonna go for these targets. EP2, you wanna to get to here. And again, there are things that you can then hold yourself accountable over time, and then go back and check these things. Um, marketing content ideas, this bit is just a big brain dump. So, every time you see something online that you like, screenshot it, save it to a file, drag it into the document. Just kind of make it a bit of a, like, a, like your own Pinterest board, basically. So you know when it comes to your music videos, or your artwork, or, your release strategy or social media assets, when you want to put that all together and when you're figuring out how much budget you've got and what you're going to use where, you can then go back to the ideas bit and then figure out what bit works best for your campaigns. Um, your campaign timeline is super important. That's like your release schedule, so what you're releasing when, but what's even more important than that is your delivery schedule. So again, work backwards. You've got your timeline, but if you're releasing on the 1st of September, when does your project need to be delivered by? I always say if you've got a full body of work, like an EP mixtape album, you should always, at the very minimum, have it delivered to DSPs four weeks in advance. Four weeks gives you a really good run-up, so you can tease it, you can kind of post it out to people, but also it gives DSPs a chance to actually see it, digest it, hear it, and it gives you time to kind of get some work in there. You want to be make, you want to make sure you kind of get you pop up on the algorithm playlists. Those playlists, the earlier you pitch it in and the earlier you deliver it, you have more chance of getting onto them. Um, when you're delivering things, how you're delivering them, making sure they're all in, making sure you're using the pitching tools properly, really, really important. So make sure you work backwards, because actually if you say, I'm releasing on the 1st of September, you might then realise, oh, I've actually only got two weeks to shoot a video, edit a video, get my artwork, deliver my artwork, mix and master the single, and you realise you have no time. And if you're working really ahead of schedule, what you should be doing is kind of in release mode for one single, you should be kind of half prepping the second or third single after that. So you've always got things to come. I always, always stress to my clients that there's no use rushing your music out. The world is not waiting for your release. It's better to have your whole campaign mapped out and have a good three, four singles into your EP ready. Can you have your music videos ready, all of them? Can you have all of your artwork ready? Can you have most of your assets ready? Let's, we don't need to have every single detail. But if you're 80% kind of ready, deliverable wise, then that lets you be a little bit more flexible with the timeline. You could release something and it could go off. So your initial four to six week gap could then go to an eight to six week gap. But actually if one song doesn't really connect that well, 
you can drop the other one because you're ready. The worst thing you can do is rush to get something out and then have a six month gap because you've got your algorithms working, you've got people coming in and following, and they're not gonna stick around for six months if you're not releasing anything else. So don't rush, get everything, get all your ducks in a row properly, and then you can go um, for your release in a stronger way. Um, digital, physical, and out of home ad buy-in, these are things like your billboards, your flyer posters, um, if you're getting physical product done, CDs, etc. If you've got digital advertising, again, these are just things that cost money. So it's just good to keep an eye and see how much money you're going to be using. If you've got a £1,000 to use for your entire marketing campaign up until your EP, you need to break that down. So then if you've got three singles and an EP, is that £250 each? If it is, okay, so are you going to use 250 just on Facebook or just on Instagram? Again, work backwards so you make sure you don't run out of money by the time you get to the end. Because um, really when you get to the end, that's when you want to be spending the most because that's the biggest part of your campaign, right? Um, sourcing wider resource as needed. This includes things like promo teams and creatives, so whether it's uh, an editor, whether it's a videographer, whether it's a PR, whether it's a radio blogger, um, figure out if you need any of these people in your team, if you've got friends around you that can do it, if you can do anything yourself. And again, if you need them, put it into your budgets, which is the next thing. Manage your marketing budget properly. Have a document, have an Excel on your, um, on your computer. Every time you spend something, write it in there. Obviously budget along the way, make sure you've got enough to kind of keep you going, but also record your actual costs as well into there. If you might have spare money, you might have leftover money. And again, tracking kind of backwards, you can then look back at other campaigns and see how much you spent on certain things and then adjust if you need to kind of go up and down. And then the last bit is your campaign analytics and reporting. This basically is just tracking how your stuff is done. Keep an eye on all of your DSP backends, your Spotify for artists, Apple Music for artists, your YouTube music, etc. Um, keep checking your social growth tracker just to make sure things are working. If you've got digital spend running, make sure you look at the results to see what's working. You might have an official video cut up as one, one of your ads, but then you might have a super organic piece of content that you've just shot on your iPhone as another, as another advert. Have a look at which one's be working better. A lot of the time, it's the organic stuff that works better than official polished bits for adverts. But have a look and then you can switch it up to make sure you're not spending the money in places that doesn't need it. Get to know each platform and find your space. There are so many social media platforms and I mean, we're always hearing of new ones, right? You don't need to stretch yourself in and be across every single one, but one thing I would recommend is every time a new one comes out, just get your name on it. So just capture your, your name, make sure it's there and it's registered. One day when you blow up, someone might have your name on threads or whatever new app it is, just make sure you have everything. It stops people faking your accounts, it just helps your kind of social media presence just look more uniform. Um, get to know your platform and see which one suits your style better as well. Are you kind of quite forward facing? Are you gonna be on camera a lot, talking to camera? Then TikTok could be one for you. If you're gonna be putting out documentaries and music videos, etc., YouTube could be your thing. Find your kind of like two or three platforms and then really, really like learn them inside out, inside out, the tips and tricks of each of them and go from there. So this is the digital health check. Um, like I said earlier, I've reserved the same URL across all platforms. Um, it just makes it nice and uniform and um, consistent for fans to find you. Create and update banners, cover photos and profile pictures to be consistent across all channels. Keep the assets related to the current release. Um, again, it just helps people know that they're your official channels. It looks cleaner, it looks better. There's no point having a picture from a year ago when your hair is completely different because it doesn't look like you. Um, generate new press images to update social media and serve press with. So this should come with every single release. Again, just to keep things fresh. Each platform should include the same bio and contact information. Um, if people can't contact you in the right places, then what's the point of being online? Identify and focus on co your core brand pillars to represent across social media. This is an important one because I find a lot that people struggle to find, post um, things on Instagram. On Instagram, I feel like your main pillar for everybody should be posting your music, right? That's like your 50 to 60 percent. But then the other 40 percent, what else are you about? Because the more you post about yourself online, the more fans will find you. You might be a music artist, but you might be a sick footballer, or you might be a wicked chef, or you might be really into politics. Whatever it is, there's other ways to find people and find fans online, and it doesn't all have to be for your music. 
Can you connect them? Are you really into fashion? Are you really into playing an instrument? Are you also a songwriter? As much as you can, break yourself down into kind of like three or four different areas and then make sure you're posting kind of that also online. Also, you want to make sure that everyone that's following you doesn't get bored. Make sure you're not just posting during your release, saying, hey, out now, listen to my music because what you've been doing for the last six months. You want people to connect with you. You want people to know your personality. Are you funny? Are you sarcastic? Have you got really dry humor? Are you super intelligent or are you a bit moody? If you're moody, do it times 100. Be a moody person on Instagram and just be really boring and horrible. Do you know what I mean? Like, make it like that. Make your captions your thing. Every single thing you put out about yourself online is your branding. From your captions, your pictures, what you're posting, the colour of your backgrounds and your Instagram stories. Really, really think about every detail you're posting and try and make it that your Instagram is like, it's like your CV nowadays, isn't it? So make sure that really, really sums you up as a whole. And that's your entire brand, which is just, which is more than just your music. Um, Yep, so yeah, um, post variety and regular posting, um, make sure it's not just around releases. Um, post, I'd say around two to three times a week, a week. Um, and also update your stories. Stories, is, as we all know, I feel like gets more, more views these days. The algorithm is forever changing Instagram. If you're not getting likes, if you're not getting comments, don't worry. It, like, I, a lot of people kind of get scared when they're not getting comments and likes on their pictures and their posts. It's fine, just I'd rather you have the content up and people have things to kind of look back on. Imagine Drake finds your Instagram page and you've been really elusive and you've got three blue boxes posted on your Instagram page because something's coming. Like that says nothing about you. And that could have been like your one opportunity to kind of get that link up with someone. If I scroll for your page and I have to kind of scroll more than twice and I haven't even heard what you sound like yet, then something's wrong. Like, I want to see you in the studio. I want to see you writing. I want to see you performing. I want to see your music videos. Post as much as you can because you never know who's going to land on your page and then how and what they're going to think of you. Um, incorporate all the interactive features from each platform into your posting strategy too. So again, each platform has their own ways and their own things. Instagram is a platform, like all the others, that the more you use their different features, the more, the more they want to boost you in the algorithm. So use stories, use reels, use... All, use Instagram lives, use Q and A's, use polls, be as interactive as possible and then interact back with the fans. If they comment on your post, like their comment, reply to their comment. Like all these little things really help boost you and your kind of your general interaction online. Um, stay active and finally show that you are artists for your posts because you'll be surprised how many people come to us for help and I look at their Instagram and I'm like, are you an influencer? Do you like trainers? Do you like, like I don't know what, what you were about, because I have to look too much. And people are lazy these days, so you've got to make it super, super easy for them. This is something we do at the start of every um, campaign that we work with clients, benchmarks of success examples. So we were working with Ivor and Joel back in 2020. Um, so this is really like, data-wise, it's really outdated. I want to start by saying all the artists on there, we're not saying she sounds like them, we're not comparing them to her, but what we are saying is these are the kind, at that time in 2020, these are the kind of artists that she would be likely to be up against to get on Radio One, um, One Extra Playlist, for example. Or there'd be similar artists that would be looked at getting on the same bill at a show. So it's just people kind of in her community, right? And the interesting thing that we found about doing things like this, again, so it tracks your things. So you've got your Spotify followers, monthly listeners, Instagram, YouTube subscribers, and your total Spotify streams from your top five popular tracks. So if we look at this, so Ivo Rindel, obviously the numbers are really small. If you look in the top right hand corner, Ivo Rindel had 3.48 million streams all together on her top five tracks on Spotify. But then you look under her and someone like Steph London's got 732 million. So she's gone clear in comparison, right? So you must think, do you know what? Her, her platform, her socials must be amazing. Same thing for somebody like Lotto Boys, 160 million streams on Spotify, that's amazing. NSG, 135 million streams on Spotify, that's amazing. But hang on a second, if you look at her YouTube channel, she's got 96.3 thousand follow, um, subscribers, which is actually, at that point, this is really, really early, so this was around the time of Rumours, which was like one of her earlier singles. So to have almost 100,000 followers on YouTube was great. So then let's scroll down and look at the people we just spoke about. Lotto Boys have got half of that. Lotto Boys, at this same time, although they had 160 million 
streams, which is 157 more than 157 million more than she had. She has double the YouTube subscribers that they had. NSG, she has quadruple the amount of YouTube subscribers that um, the NSG had. Again, NSG were going off at these times. This was like options kind of time. But one of the points here is that we worked really, really hard on her YouTube strategy to make sure there's a ton of content. We were always driving people to, towards her YouTube, whether it was behind the scenes videos, lyric videos, official videos, extra content. She used to do kind of like chatty videos of other like influencers and stuff. You know, like, so she had a bit more of a YouTube journey. And again, this was one of her main platforms that we identified super early in the campaign and said, this is one of our key platforms to work on with her. And it worked. And then I think a little while after this, she got her big 100,000 subscriber plaque. So this is really good to just have, just to kind of put yourself in and around your kind of your peers and see how you're doing. We're not comparing, we're not saying who's better, we're not saying who's worse, we're not saying you sound like them. Darko and Ivory and sound nothing like each other. They shouldn't even be compared, right? But if you look at the numbers, which is actually what we're trying to do, because we're trying to get really granular, you can see who's working on what. There's so many artists nowadays. At this point, Shabo, who obviously a couple of years later had like had a good moment. She didn't even have a YouTube channel. Pounds didn't even have a YouTube channel. They'd just be using platforms like GRM Daily. Again, using platforms like GRM and LinkUp, they're great because they can kind of get you exposure and get you out there. However, Ask yourself the question, is it better for you to start your own channel and start from zero and just build and build and build? Do you know what I mean? So it's just kind of to get your brain ticking and just to see who's doing what where. You can't really help your streams. People listen to you if they like you, right? But all the other places, you can actually work on them. You can direct people to follow you on Spotify. You can direct people to follow you on Instagram. You can direct people to subscribe to your channel. But you've got to give them reasons why to do that. So just keep that in mind. Um, here are some resources that um, we would recommend using. I don't know, if, has anyone ever used Fiverr? Yeah. yeah, it's really easy to use. There's a ton of creatives on there. You can kind of have budgets from 20 pounds up to 20 grand. So whatever your budget, you can kind of get someone in there to do almost anything, videos, logos, artwork, etc. cetera. Um, Creative Commission is also a good one. It's like, again, it's worldwide. You upload your pitch at your kind of deck about what you want and then creatives come to you with examples of their previous work. You then select a creative, and then from there, they can kind of start working on your thing. Um, I mean, I worked with, I found a designer on Creative Commission for Retro Free 2's project. I worked his album Free 2 a few years ago, and we got our designer from that website. Um, MMF is good, Spot and Track is another, kind of, has anyone heard of Spot and Track? Um, so it's one, it's, you actually have to pay for it now, but what I do, and what I used to do is, um, I used to just make a new email address every two weeks because I was cheap back then. Um, so make yourself a new email address every couple of weeks because it tells you all your streaming data across the board, it tells you your platform editions, Spotify, Apple, etc. And actually over time they're getting more and more data onto the website. So it's quite a good place just to have everything in one. Um, and you, you can also look at other people's um, playlist editions and stuff as well. So I find that that's a really, really handy one that I still use today. And again, your DSP IS dashboards, which are just there in front of you, so make sure you've all got, have you all got access to all of your back end, your Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, Deezer, all of them have them, so keep an eye on that, all your stats and your demographics in there. Um, right, so this is an example of a marketing campaign overview that I said at the beginning. I was working with infamous Isaac a few years ago. This is really small, um, but this is just kind of showing you everything we just spoke about. So we start off this is the timeline. We had a list and a link to the thing. Also, it's just really good and it's handy to have everything in one document. If you have extra people on your team, you can all work from the same document. Everything, this should end up being like your Bible. So it starts off being two pages and it ends up being 25 by the end. Your artist proposition. Again, this is three lines that we came up with to describe who he is and what he's about. Again, this was back in 2020, so it's all very outdated information, but you should get the idea. Audience-wise, um, Fans also listen to, obviously we've all got that feature on Spotify, but also who do you want to be kind of put in the same bracket as? You can make that up at this point because that's where you're trying to plan to get to, right? Spotify playlist, Apple playlist, again, this is the kind of playlist that you think you should be featured on, haven't done your own research, etc. Um, and then once you have your access to your DSP backends, which you will do, you can have a look at your demographics, your listeners, etc. and make this a little bit more specific and precise. Promo successes to date. Again, like I said earlier, make sure you highlight everything you've done 
whether it's a radio play, a show, et cetera, et cetera. It's just good to have the, and again, when you end up getting people like PRs and radio partners and stuff on board, it's really handy because then you can just give them all this information and they know everything about you. You don't have to wreck your brains and try and figure it out. Um, these are our targets for him. This is the, the tracker that I was saying. So again, every we end up doing it every couple of weeks because his weren't growing too much at this point because we hadn't started the campaign. Like you can see Twitter grew seven followers in two weeks. So you don't need to track that every week, but track it as often as you need. And then once you've tracked it for, I say about four weeks, and then you should put your own KPIs in, your KPIs, your targets. So you should say to yourself, okay, cool, we're starting on 15,000 followers, at 15,000 monthly listeners, by the end of the campaign, I wanna to get to 53,000 monthly listeners. And again, you can track that along the way and, and kind of make sure you're moving um, and trying to attain your targets. And your key headlines to work towards in your campaign, 100,000 views in one week on a neutral channel. It can just be as broad as that. One extra capital, um, capital extra playlist. Consistent growth across um, your followers. It doesn't have to be anything tricky or anything, but just make sure you have something to work towards. And this was the benchmark success. The same thing that I just showed you for, in, um, for Ivor and Doll. This was our version for him. Uh, marketing suggestions, just extra bits to kind of give him an idea on just extra elements of the campaign. Mailing lists are always good. They're a bit old school, but they're actually a really good way to kind of keep in touch with your fans. Um, especially when it comes to kind of later on when you start doing shows and like you're selling merchandise, etc. It's really good to have your own mailing list because you can just blast that direct to their in um, inboxes. DJ dubs, super, super old school, but actually some DJs still really like them. So if there's, and even if they don't play it, I feel like spending, spending the time to do it for some people, they might really appreciate it. So like things like that are just interesting to do. Um, and this is a social keep housekeeping digital health check that we did. So again, going through each platform and saying which one, like how to improve them. Don't need to take you through all the thing, but just I wanted to show you how it is all kind of set up. Uh, this uh, is an example of the Wretch campaign that I just said we did um, a few years ago, and just how we made sure we linked everything from social media to the real world along the way before we even release anything. So this was the artwork for the album. I'm not sure if any of you remember it because it's quite a few years ago now. Um, but to release the album, to announce the album, sorry, we asked a ton of influencers to send us a picture of them standing there like this. And everyone was like, huh? That's really weird. I don't understand why. And then we got an animator to basically draw the balloon in. So the balloon would like come out of the hand and then it would blow up into this big red balloon. We then told all the artists and influencers to post that balloon video at the same time with the same caption, which literally just said FR32 and the balloon emoji. That was it. That's all the information we gave them. Um, and then everyone started being like, what's going on? What's going on? And then everyone started making their own versions of it. These are just random people online. They'd be drawing it on paint. They'd be adding their own emojis in there. But it kind of, and then Rich posted it and then he posted the date for his album release. This red balloon then became like the big thing around the album. We then posted a freestyle. It was literally, it was made, a freestyle made for Instagram. So at the time, Instagram videos could be 60 seconds long. It was around the time where vertical videos kind of just went live. So we literally filmed it on uh, an iPhone and we filmed it so it filled up the entire screen and Rex is looking directly into the camera lens. So again, things like this, details like that really help because it makes it feel more personal. When the viewer's watching it and he's looking in your eyes, it feels more like, and it kind of, it draws your, your timeline when you're scrolling through, it makes you stop and watch, right? So he did a 60 second um, freestyle and then at the end he announced the album title and date and then everyone obviously put two and two together with the red balloon and that. Both things went completely viral and we had loads of people um, posting their own version. Artwork, the top one and the bottom one here, they're different um, artworks for singles. Again, when you start your campaign, the reason I want you to plan it so, so much from the beginning is so you link everything in properly. You know that these three um, pieces of artwork are linked to the same, same campaign, yeah? Because it's obvious, they all look the same. It's always good to have something consistent to link all your things together. It could be a colour scheme, it could be the same type of artist that, that has done it, it could be a similar pose of a, um, of a picture. Whatever it is, try and make all your creative linked together. 
Um, we then announced a show for him again, and then at the show, we made sure the stage was basically this. So we had like the big red balloon and we kind of had the blue sky and the clouds or whatever in the stage. So we made sure this creative was consistent throughout. Our gifting strategy was we had 32 key DJs and industry contacts. They received a big white box. And then as they opened the box, a helium filled red balloon floated out of it. And then it had the CD at the bottom of the thing. Things like this, super, super simple, super cheap to do because it's literally a balloon in a box. But it went completely viral online, um, which worked really well. Um, and then we had our outdoor floor stencils. We placed balloons all over the city. So you just see red balloons everywhere. When we did his um, fire in the booth, we filled the studio with red balloons. So basically these balloons were everywhere. And then everyone started commenting on how great the marketing campaign was because everyone was just finding it somewhere, somehow, whether it's a red balloon in the street, whether it's a red balloon box, whether it's social media, but we made sure everything we did in the real world came back to socials and then back again outside to the real world. The reason I wanted to show you this is just so you can kind of start thinking about what content you're using, what strategy you're gonna be building, what assets you want to be creating, how your artwork branding and your EP branding, your, your project branding, how then that can be stretched out through the entire campaign and kind of through your live performances, to your gifting, to your radio promo and beyond. There should be like a really strong connection there. Um, skip that. Right, so I've spoken loads, so I'm going to ask you guys some questions. Um, so in the absence of a music video, what could you do to market your single release? So again? Gig, shows. Gig, yeah, you can do shows. Or do you mean online? Online, more, yeah. So if you didn't have an official music video, what could you... Freestyle. Freestyle videos, yeah. What you can say? Just like little videos. Yeah, film your own promo videos on your iPhone. Anything else? Making our videos, how you made the single, exactly. I think a lot of people worry that they don't have budgets to pull together big shiny videos. But actually, I don't know if you guys agree, and be honest with me, I don't think official music videos do what they used to do back in the day, right? I think a lot of people now might put two grand in, five grand in to make a music video, and they have no budget left for the rest of their campaign, whether it's advertising or whether it's creating assets. And then for four weeks, you're posting the same clip from the same YouTube video on your same Instagram and you're getting the same response, which is not really a response, right? So would you not rather than take that two grand, that five grand, and turn it into, okay, let's make a documentary along the way. Let's capture and make our videos in the studio. Let's make content with my mobile phone, which is with me all the time, all day, every day. I can film everything myself on my phone that I already have. That costs you zero money. You can put on shows to announce your project, to play your music back. I think now it's just here gone. I think it depends on your audience, to be honest. Yeah. Um, some may want a music video or like you know, something like that. Um, some may like I don't know, maybe you do a show, you give out a couple of CDs, maybe it's like one hundred and fifty. Exactly. Something like that. That might be a closer experience with your fans because it's like you know you're actually giving it to them. Exactly. So they need a copy. They know they're not getting it again. I was there. That kind of Exactly. And then it's something tangible that fan can keep the whole time, right? Yeah. And then when you're on yeah, album yeah, number six, higher, yeah. they can say, I had his first ever physical CD yeah. and you only ever made a hundred of them. So, you know, it's a, do you know what I mean? Thinking about like key things like this that actually can make your campaign stand out and be a little bit different. I'm not saying never do a music video again, because I actually still use them, but I'm saying don't waste all of your budget on a music video. And actually you can be more creative with it. So rather than having to get a cameraman and a DOP and lighting and sound and da da da. You can actually film so much of it on your phone or you can have your own like film camera or whatever it is. You can do things a lot cheaper these days. And I feel like those videos that are a little bit more lo-fi, a little bit more authentic, I feel like they go a lot further than the super polished, pulling up in the Ferrari type of videos that we see 20 times over. So I think just kind of keep that in mind and, and try and put your money elsewhere. Um, do you view meme pages as a valuable marketing tool? and explain your answer. So pages like Made You Think, Shade Bara, Link Up, etc. Do you think they're useful to use? I don't think so, not, not much anymore. Like maybe like 2015, 2014 was really cool, mm -hmm. um, but not now. I think like now it's just mainly like TikTok pages, like memes and Instagram reels and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, just see like the popular trending ones and then implement your own things. Yeah? yeah. Anyone else? Can you? I think with 
probably are valuable. Um, if you can, I think you've, like at the end of what you just said, it's changing what the, the memes that are out there mm -hmm. kind of fit your own campaign kind of works exactly. really well. Exactly. That's okay. So that's where I wanted to get to. So. I don't think it's worth, again, spending thousands of pounds on these things. However, if you are going to use them, make sure you're giving them content that works for their audience. That's the key thing. If you're giving Link Up or Meiji Think or Shape Bara the same YouTube video cut down that you're posting on your own page, and you scroll through their own Instagram and they don't actually post YouTube video cut downs, that's not gonna resonate with their, with their followers, right? And they're, and the idea of paying them to post your thing is that you want it to kind of come back to you, you want to get followers, you want to get streams. So make sure you're giving them content that suits their page, that obviously still reflects you, but whether you could turn it into a meme or you could put up a more, like a deeper video. It could be a video of you explaining the lyrics. It could be a video of you in the studio. It could be a video of you singing a cappella. And again, all of these things can link back to your campaign, but they might work 10 times better on these types of pages. So again, use the, the pages that are out there, but make sure you use them in a good way. Otherwise, it's, it kind of tends to be a bit of a waste of money. Um, do you have any examples of marketing campaigns with strong online presence that you've really liked or disliked? Barbie. Barbie, oh my God, marketing campaign has been exceptional for Barbie. I'm so upset that wasn't my campaign. I think the Kanye West roll up with Donda was like yeah. amazing. Yeah. Oh, it's like loads of things involved, like with all the shows and like, you know, you get a song piece by piece, and we don't know what the cover looks like. Mm -hmm. um, you hear like the features come in once in a while, sometimes they'll change because it wasn't ready. Yeah. And then, you know, the whole rollout and the, the, the kind of beef with Drake that helped yeah, out yeah, as well, just yeah. like back in the day with Kanye and 50 Cent. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, all of those elements that you just said about giving bits out piece by piece, um, music change, obviously, music changes. I feel like Kanye is probably one of the only people that can do that in the world. But, take elements that you like, remain a fan of music. So when you're making your own marketing plan for your own release, look, about, look at what you've seen in the world and take elements from what you think has worked. I feel like everyone and their mum is releasing music these days, right? So how are you gonna break through? You wanna make sure you've got elements in the campaign that people are gonna talk about for ages. When we did the Rich Free 2 album, people spoke about that red balloon for so long afterwards. It is a red balloon. It's not groundbreaking. Do you know what I mean? When you look at the artwork, it's actually really basic. It is a hand holding a balloon on a sky. And when you describe it to someone, it sounds really dead. But because we made sure it was all over the place throughout that entire campaign, music videos, in real life, shows, etc., it really, really worked and it really um, did the job, basically. Uh, name two features on each social platform that you can use as a part of your campaign rollout. Uh, who wants to take Instagram? Um, I'll say Instagram Live. Yeah. Um, yeah. And probably like the, the boosting. You, know, you, boost, you, add them there, right? you can do ads on there, yeah. Probably that as well. But I don't know. What about things like, um, like Q&As? I find Q&As are always really good around your releases. People can ask you questions about your project. How you made the project, etc. Again, it's just time, it's a way for you to kind of feel closer to the fans and for them to feel closer to you. Um, who wants to take YouTube? Yeah, um, YouTube, I think if you like, same thing, QA, like if you follow them on the previous video, like, oh, listen to them in the comments, the next video, I'll read them out. Um, and then maybe like reels. Reels are really getting numbers. The shorts. Yeah, the shorts. shorts. Yeah, the shorts. Exactly. They're going crazy right now. So maybe like it's a popular clip you already have, or one yeah. of the stuff that trash in, and then you cut it up like four or five, six different ways, and like take out the initial parts and put it on there. Exactly. And YouTube shorts is something they're really pushing. So again, if you're using features that are pre existing on platforms, that the platform themselves are pushing, they'll like it, and then in return, you'll end up kind of getting pushed in the algorithm a little bit better. Do you know about YouTube commun um, community? So on everyone's YouTube channel, go home and when you have a look at your own channel, you've got a community tab, and it's basically like a Twitter timeline slash Facebook timeline, kind of all in one. So you can post a sentence on it, you can post a GIF on there, you can post a music video link on there, and basically, as you encourage people to subscribe to your channel, as they do, 
if you then post a link to your new music video on your YouTube community tab, you might come up on their YouTube homepage. So it's just, again, another way for people to kind of find you on YouTube. People can like it, people can comment it. Again, it's just another element of YouTube that they're trying to push onto you. Um, all right, scenario. You are working on a campaign for a brand new artist's first ever release. If you had a £500 budget, would you rather use the budget to hire a radio plugger, to hire a PR, or would you rather use the money in the digital space? Explain why. Who wants to take it? I'm taking a break right now. So. You're taking a break? Yeah, I'm taking a break right now. So. <laughs> I think it's probably do the latter because to hire a radio plugger seems like that would take the majority of that budget. Mm -hmm. And actually, Generate more interest using the digital space, and then they get on to like BBC introducing already having a presence. Yeah, exactly. Anyone else have an opinion? I think, yeah, digital space. I think when you people want to see the buzz in it, mm -hmm. when you've got the buzz going, you then tend to be able to get into radio and, and everything else not takes care of yourself but it starts to build itself mm. and you can start to get gigs and if you know what you're doing in the digital space mm -hmm. you might then say okay well i'm going to um sell some some merch or whatever and then you can start exactly. with all the other things i mean i've done this question before and every time i ask a question everyone always says they'll hire a team they'll hire a plugger or, or a pr um so i like you guys i like that you guys said digital <laughs> £500, <laughs> probably got you no money. But honestly, the amount of artists that don't have any budget and they say, I've got £250 only, I need a radio plug or a PR to work for me £250. But you haven't released anything yet. So what you need to do is you need to get yourself out there. You need to start building your own story, right? So whether you use that money for content, for somebody to edit it, whether you use it to boost your post for digital advertising online, you need to start creating your story so that when you do have budget and when it is the right time to get a radio plugger and a PR on board, they then have a story to tell to people. Otherwise, they're just going to say, this is X artist, she's from here, this is her first single. And what else is getting written in the press release, apart from like your upbringing or your musical knowledge, or do you know what I mean? You want to be able to say, she's had plays on BBC Introducing already. She has early supporters with this DJ. He's done an underplay show in his local town that sold out. It could be a show that you've done in the pub around the corner from your house with 30 people in there, but that's the, the capacity. So you've done a sold out show in your hometown. It's about perception. It's just about creating these headlines for yourselves and just trying to build a story. And then at the right time, you can then start getting your team involved and kind of spreading your budget elsewhere. Um, how long do we have to go, yeah? It's five minutes. Eh? All right, lovely. I feel like I've spoken enough at you guys. Um, do you have any questions? We have five minutes. So I've got a question. So let's say you're releasing a song, but you don't have a music video. What ways would you go about promoting it on? We said this earlier, innit? So we said, if you don't have an official music video, you can make other assets. So whether it's assets you're making your mobile phone, whether it's like short clips you're using for social media. So if you come up with a bank of like 10 to 15 short videos, and every single asset you should create for different platforms, so the specs for Instagram and the specs for TikTok are different. The specs for, I don't know, YouTube Shorts is completely different to Instagram. So you wouldn't want to be posting the exact same thing across all the platforms, right? But just make sure you have like, even if it's just bite-sized pieces of content, it could be you talking to camera, it could be behind the scenes videos, it could be making like the song in the studio. Um, it could be the rollback videos of yourself. You could collate like home videos of yourself singing or rapping if you were like, like as a young kid. Just try and get a little bit more creative with it. Um, and get extra content kind of that you can post in that absence of a music video. Would you say, like, let's say posting a chorus or part of the song within, before it comes out, would you say that makes an impact as well? Yeah. That yeah, 100%. Cool. If you're teasing your song before it comes out, then by the time the song comes out, everyone wants to hear more of it, right? So a lot of people do that on TikTok. So a lot of people will release a TikTok sound even like four to six weeks before the song is officially released. Okay. And you've got a bite size piece of the single on TikTok that you can start using on your posts and you can encourage your friends and your family to use on their posts Then hopefully fans start using it on their posts then by the time the song comes out the sound might have been used 100, 200 times 
which is good. Do you know what I mean? And then people are already a little bit familiar with the song, and then they're going to want to hear the rest of it. If you post the chorus, they're going to be like, well, what does the rest of the song sound like? And they're going to be more inclined to then rush to go and listen to, or watch whatever content you've got, or listen to the whole song. So I think as much as you can tease along the way, don't give away the whole song, because there's nothing to look for after. But as much as you can tease along the way, like little bite-sized snippets, that like, definitely will help you. So are you able to do that then, put a little bit of a sound up before you actually release the song? Yeah, yeah. Um, you can either deliver it officially or you can just upload it on your own like original sound. Um, but because it, it doesn't technically go into the on-air on play rules because you're not monetizing or anything like you would if it was on YouTube. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, make sure your YouTube video, etc., all goes out at the same time or later than your, your DSP audio. But TikTok is a harder world. So you can use that. That should be used as like a massive part of your kind of pre-release strategy. And actually, a lot of artists will put up maybe two or three different snippets and see which one feels a little better or see which one kind of gets more of a vibe from people. You can kind of bring fans into your rollout and say to them, like, what one do you like better? Like, help me decide. You might have already decided, but it might be part of your strategy to, like, to make them feel like they're deciding your rollout for you. Any other questions? No? All right, I think we're good then. Sorry, she's so busy, isn't she? Um, we'll have a little break, like 10-15 minutes. Um, if anyone needs a drink, please get one. I'm not safe, but we can be there. Yeah, pay for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, Start again at three o'clock. Yeah, get a drink. We're gonna go into the other side of the coin, which is PR with Rachel White. Also, there's a couple of guys still here from before as well, so make sure you drop them, okay? But 10 minutes, that's a bit sat down, ready to go.